Well, joining me now is somebody who needs absolutely no introduction at all. She is Doctor Who royalty, and she is ace in every single way, Sophie Aldred. Hello, Sophie. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. That's really sweet of you. Thank That's you. It's a pleasure. How are you? How are you doing there? Yeah, well, it's a loaded question nowadays, isn't it? It is. You know, yeah. It's really, um, and, um, and I think I can, I can safely say that I'm really well, really doing well as well mm -hmm. um i'm i'm grateful every day for the fact that we have a garden that um i'm with my family you know i'm with my close family my my husband and uh, my two boys who are now 20 and 16 mm -hmm. and who are great human beings you know we 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 even play board games together or we get on really well together so we're very very fortunate and I guess, you know, that sort of what brings up for me, though, is people who aren't so fortunate. And, you know, and I think if if people who are watching this are some of those people, then, you know, my my heart goes out for people who are not so fortunate from from people who can't get out the house, who haven't got a garden, who may be in like a, a one bedroom flat, which is appearing to be very confining um, to people who may be aren't as fortunate as I am with with family relationships and and kind of stuck in a situation where perhaps you don't want to be and uh, what do you do about that you know like I was just thinking about my son who he came out when he was 14 I think just before his 14th birthday and and of course we're you know we're very accepting and we we absolutely you know there's no there's nothing there but mm. I know that for some people and uh, some parents wouldn't be uh, like that, you know, and, and it's very, very difficult. So people who are maybe having to hide something or feel that they are not able to express themselves how they really want to be, I think it must be very, very hard for... It must be, it must be. Yeah. How, how, do you, uh, how do you relax? If you're ever having one of those days when you think, oh, wait, the world is here, how does Sophie Aldred actually just try and shake all, all of that away that's a really good question actually because my husband's always trying to get me to relax yeah, yeah. I, I'm a doer you know mm. and uh, and I love doing stuff and it could be um you know sometimes um well he kind of thinks that I do far too much and he he loves not doing you know he loves relaxing he's very good at it so we've got this perfect balance so <laughs> he's taught me the art of the afternoon nap over the many years we've been together, which I used to think was anathema. You know, it was like a sin to go and lie down in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, I, I sometimes take myself off for a little nap. All oh, right. Or, um, I mean, I, I'm, I've got lots of things I, I love doing. Um, at the moment, of course, gardening is just, oh, I'm really enjoying that. Mm. This morning I've, I, um, I've just been putting plants, digging up bushes and putting them in slightly different places than, you know, get them to have a bit more light and things, looking after those. Um, what else do I like doing? Um, well, I'm watching RuPaul's Drag Race at the moment with my younger son, who's an addict. Um, and what else do I do? Just, yeah, playing board games with the family. We, we love doing that. We're doing... Uh, we've got a bit of code names going on at the moment. We've done a bit of Sheriff of Nottingham the other night. Uh, we also like, um, there's a great game called Avalon, and there's one, oh, what's it called again? It's Oh, Betrayal at the House on the Hill. I can never remember the name. Which that sounds is, wonderful, that one. Sounds yeah. Terribly dramatic, so, that one. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, and reading, reading. I absolutely love a good book. There's nothing like a good book. Oh, and yes, my, my eldest son is here in the background giving me hand signals. Um, we all decided at the beginning of this to take something on, like so many people have done, you know, a kind of new skill. Mm -hmm. And so I've been learning very slowly and, and um, painfully the guitar. So I can do, I can do chord, four chords now. Right. Um, 
I'm 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 not very good at it, and I'm not very good at not being very good at stuff either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Could this be a skill that we will see on the convention circuit in a few years? Maybe. I very much doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so can I ask then, I mean, you're obviously a, a creative person, which you'd expect with you working within the performing arts. Um, were, you a, were you a very creative child? Can you, can you remember, can you remember when creativity and performance first became something that's important to you? I'll tell you something really funny. I was cleaning out the garage the other day, which is something else I was really enjoying doing. Um, and I found a couple of shoe boxes uh, and I'd forgotten that they were there. I hadn't looked at them for a while. And they are letters from my mum to my grandmother and my grandmother to my mum mm. from when I was small. And, and me and my brother were growing up. And they're just, they're like gold. They're like, they, they're both incredibly good writers. They really like, they write exactly how they talk. So I can hear their voices as they're writing. And there's one I came across which struck me, which was, um, I think I was about three and a half. My brother was about one and a half. And we went to stay with my grandmother who uh, and grandfather who lived up in South Derbyshire in Ilkeston, near Nottingham. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to love going up. Anyway, she describes in great detail throughout this letter, um, apparently I was watching Wimbledon and I'm three and... She said there's a, an American player called Richie, surname Richie. She said with a horrible buzz cut. Um, <laughs> she, she, she was very much into appearances. Um, and she said, I didn't like him at first. And then all of a sudden, she said, I, I absolutely, I became this persona. And I had to be called Richie. And then one morning she, she says, um, so, Sophie came down this morning wearing a, um, uh, um, her grandfather's cap from prep school, a tie around her neck and carrying about three tennis rackets. And f about 10 days later, she said, I can't believe that she's still keeping this up, um, mm. this, this, this character, basically. Um, I refuse to be called anything but Richie. So if people called me Sophie, I was absolutely, you know, they were like, uh, yeah, they, they were persona non grata. And it describes this all in. So I think right from such an early age, I was playing parts. You know, I don't know where that came from or why, but there was obviously something that I saw in this character of this tennis player that I wanted to be. Were you were you playing parts or believing them? Because that sounds a bit deeper. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. It's almost like method, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, yeah, from Which... the persona. Yeah, and that's, I, I was going to ask this a lot later, but I'll, I'll jump to it now. Um, there's two moments, um, both in season 26 of your Doctor Who, um, two moments, um, one in studio, one on location, which I find totally believable. Um, and one of those moments is when you have a bit of a breakdown in Ghost Light and end up on the floor. Um, and the other is when you say the line, I didn't know she was my mum at the end of The Curse of Fenric. And yeah. that they, they seem so honest. And uh, Elizabeth Sladen um, always said, I just believe it. That's what I do. I just believe it. When it comes to acting, do you just believe it? Or do you have a particular method that you have to work through or any, anything like that? Yeah, great question. Funny, you know, because having said all that about method and taking on these these characters, I'm not I'm not a method actress, and um, I yeah I don't know what it is. I think by that time with Ace, all right from the very beginning, there was something about Ace that I identified with. Mm. Don't know what it was. Totally different backgrounds, not like her at all. Naturally, she's much more kind of braver and bold than I am. Although I was when I was younger, much much. Brave and bolder, but um, I think those two particular lines. No, because when you bear in mind, the second one is a bit different because I didn't know she was my mum. Mm. Uh, we did. We uh, was that the one on the rocks? Just it is I just before the dark. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Of course, we only had one shot at that, 
Mm. So I know that I was actually probably thinking more about how cold's that water going to be and am I going to dive in properly? Right. Um, and then ghost light, you bear in mind that we've been rehearsing as well and I've done probably done a few takes of that. Mm. And I think that's the difference is that you, I don't know, I think I allowed the character to take over. Mm. I don't know, I just kind of knew how to do it, if you know what I mean. I can't really analyse it, I can't really explain it. Yeah. Well, it can just be such an instinctive thing, can't it, I, I suppose. I think w what fascinated me with the two, obviously you've got um, one on location, but the other in studio. Um, and I think it's a, a handheld camera, one camera just on you crumpling to the floor and a blue light that looks like it was uh, put in live in the studio. And yet you have to react. Is, is Were you able to do all this? Do you think it's because um, Doctor Who was rehearsed, which doesn't really happen now? Was it, was it down to rehearsal? I don't know, really. No, I don't think so. I, I always thrived on, I think it's attention seeking. I always loved having an audience. And, uh -huh. uh, and, and if the audience is like uh, 500 people in a theatre or uh, four crew members standing around holding a blue light, you know, or whatever, that that's that I, I don't know there's um I've never found it difficult to to do I suppose mm. I've never I've never really um questioned why it is um mm. I don't think it was about rehearsals I I'm one of these people who um I actually like first takes mm. um and I've had to really learn how to slow down, really. Um, I've noticed as well with um, even doing jobs around the house, I'll always be thinking ahead to the next thing, you know. Uh, and actually being present in the moment, even like, you know, doing the washing up or something, is actually very satisfying and very much more, um, I don't know, much more meditative in a way. Yeah. So I've had to learn not to uh, right, do it all on the first take and mm. then be trying to repeat something that, that I found on the first take, mm. um, especially because other actors um, are often better on their second or third take. Yeah. So I've had to kind of learn how to do that, really. Okay. Can I ask about rehearsal? Mm. Because to, to a fan, uh, if you say the words Acton Hilton, it's like a, a magical land. Presumably it wasn't like that if you were actually in there. Um, but could you tell me about the uh, an average rehearsal process on a show like Doctor Who and, and what it was like to actually be able to drill down with these scripts and, and, and work them out and what difference it made to the show? Well, it was a bit like a magical land. For me, I'd never experienced anything like it before, obviously. So... Um, you get to North Acton uh, Tube Station, uh, which is now all built up and it's got all these fancy blocks of apartments around it. But in the day, North Acton was a kind of industrial place and uh, not a very salubrious part of town to go to. Mm. So, you know, you get off the tube, you walk up the hill and cross the road and then you go into this tower block, in effect, a sort of, you know, 19... 60s I guess tower block and there's a thing over the door a canopy which says BBC and you walk in and there's the security guard there and it's all very um corporate very I mean not corporate that we understand it now with mm. logo and things like that but just very very bare and 60s yeah and then big lift go up in the lift and then there's these big rooms uh which are all the rehearsal rooms diff differing in size and um, and they're bare, they're empty. There's windows all along one side, like in a tower block. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're great big rooms. And then you'd have a table for that you'd go for the read through initially. So ev all the actors and then uh, John Nathan Turner, the director. Um, uh, I can't remember who. Oh, well, Andrew Cartmel, script editor. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the lighting cameraman would be there. Costume designer, set designer. Uh, makeup designer would all be there with the actors around this table and then you'd sit and you'd read the script and you'd kind of um you'd be eyeing up the other actors you know 
uh, how famous are they or, you know, oh, I, I recognize that person. Um, and then, um, and then, so that would be the read through and that would be, uh, and then I can't remember whether we'd go straight into rehearsals or not, but you would usually have, like, it would be broken up into who was there on which days because uh, obviously you couldn't you didn't want the whole cast there sitting around if they were they were only going to be used for one scene in the day yeah. so you have people coming and going um and then the the room would be marked out with bits of tape on the floor to represent different areas of the studio or location and then they had these i remember these metal poles which had a sort of round base and just a metal pole and they were like corners of a room or used to denote various places yeah and then they actually had a sort of um a mock-up of the tardis console which was uh, just sort of like um a uh, bit of plywood and uh, you know but very rough mm -hmm. and then furniture so you know old school chairs and things and rickety old tables and things which which the floor assistant and the stage um stage manager in effect would use to delineate the, the different parts of the set so then it was always quite a shock when you got into studio and you weren't working with these old school chairs and and metal poles they were actually the set so that was always very exciting to see oh wow yes it looks real now yeah um, what was it like that first day uh, when you went along to tv center famous building mm -hmm. and you don't just go into a studio you go into tc1 biggest studio in europe and and there's you on your first television job. What was the what was the emotion like for you for you as an actor? I suppose was it excitement or or fear or both? A bit of both, I think. Um, I remember just what what was wonderful, of course, was that we'd had a a week or whatever it was of rehearsing, so I knew Bonnie and Sylve quite well by then, and um, uh, the makeup designer and the people doing the set and stuff. So. so it wasn't completely, I felt like I was amongst friends, Pat Quinn, um, Eddie Peel in particular, they were all kind of very supportive. And the very first scene I did when I, well, I had to go out onto the floor in my costume, first of all, because they had to see whether it, what it would look like on camera. And they, I remember just standing there and the camera kind of, because it was a great big camera in those days, of course. Mm lowering down like that giving me the once over as it were and uh, they realized that the stripy tights quite wide stripes as I remember I think I I think we'd chosen black and yellow a bit like a bee um that I uh, and they strobed uh so I uh, that wasn't going to work so I had to go off to the little costume place um because by the side of the the um uh, the studio were places where makeup was done, where costume was done and so on. And, um, and the costume people, they found some red tights somewhere. So I put those on, got dressed up again, you know, then they did the whole thing again, looking at me. And I mean, but of course, there's Sylvester joking and, um, and there's and Eddie Peel and everyone. So it, it wasn't, it, it, was, it was more exciting than frightening. And then there was the time, the, the very first shot I did was when Kane, the baddie, Eddie Peel, is holding the coin up mm. in front of Ace's face. And uh, he, I can't remember whether it was him, but I think it was, he whispered, just look up. And I looked up and there were monitors hung around the, uh, the ceiling of the studio, way up, so that the costume people, that everyone can check, mm. you know, is the hair right, is it, um, and check the shot as well. And huge on the screen all around these monitors was my face and that was quite a like oh you know wow <laughs> that was weird um but yeah it was it was an amazing experience to be in it was I think at the time it was the largest studio in Europe as mm. well TC1 yeah mm. you mentioned costume there um one of the one of the most amazing things I think with with the character of Ace was that she didn't conform to that stereotype. Um, not just with the the screaming that Doctor Who uh, assistants are famous for, but also in terms of costume. You you stayed in the docks and the and the bomber jacket. Was that down to you 
wanting the character to remain true? Uh, yeah, very much. Um, I mean, funnily enough, it, uh, she didn't. I wasn't in docs uh, for most of the series. Uh, funny, that's what that's what we always remember, isn't it? Yeah. But then looking back, um, actually, I was wearing boots. I, these boots, but they weren't docs. Yeah. Were from I remember they were from a shop called Hobbs, and they had those. Um, like ski boots, they had those eyelets that you did the laces up around. I've still got them somewhere in the attic. They yeah. don't fit me now because my feet have grown weirdly. Uh, uh, since, since having had children, that often happens apparently, that your feet grow. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so, and then there was a bit of streamlining, which I was quite happy with um, uh, because the jacket obviously was quite bulky. Uh, and of course, me being vain, I don't want to look too bulky on camera. So I was quite glad to be able to sort of hang it over my shoulder at times. Or um, So some of the costumes, particularly, yeah, I'm thinking of ghost light now. You know, I was in leggings and quite a sort of figure-hugging top with the shoulders showing. Yeah. Um, but then I knew that I was going to get into the, the Victorian man's costume and then the Victorian dress at some point. So... That was okay, but I, I was so fortunate that I had such a big say in my costume, yeah, and all yeah. costume designers would consult me about that. And then um, Andrew Cartmel was a great hand in that as well initially, because uh, he and I just knew really what she would wear, the kinds of things that she would wear. Um, and John was really acquiescent. It was great because he he could see that Ace was a different kind of character. Um, and, you know, that th this required a different kind of look as well. Yeah. So, as an actress, uh, at any point, thinking of when you were working uh, in the later, starting off in the early, late 80s, rather, in television, um, I'm thinking now in terms of, obviously, recently we've, we've seen the Me Too movement. Um, were you, as a female actress, ever aware of... Of, of anything within the industry that, that made you feel uncomfortable or made you worry of, of just being able to do your job? Or was this something that you were able to avoid? I, I look back and I think, you know, A, those were different times. Mm. Um, B, there's no excuse for, for uh, that kind of behaviour. But, you see, I was just so fortunate to be with Sylvester McCoy, who who's uh who comes from a radical political background where feminism uh developed grew um i myself came from you know i was a manchester university graduate uh uh sort of uh, uh i mean although i i wouldn't call myself a radical feminist um i i just i've always got on very very well with men and I never, ever really made any differentiation between. And I don't know whether that gave me a sort of confidence um, with how to deal with any situation. And also, don't forget the character of Ace. Mm. People don't want to mess with Ace. Yeah. Um, you know, so all those things combined was bad. Of course, sexist remarks were rife. But, hey, you know, th that was... It was a different generation. I was just talking about this the other day, um, and I was talking to it about it with the boys, and it seems extraordinary now that that we used to say certain that well, racism, sexism, uh, uh, but it was just a it was a natural, naturally occurring thing in family. You know, you it was just stuff that you'd say. Mm. Um, and then I luck. I was at the beginning of right consciousness. Mm. Um, and having said that, no, I never experienced anything. Certainly in my television career, I had experienced. There's one thing that I experienced um, early on when I was. I auditioned for a one-woman show of St. Joan, and uh, there was a director who seemed a bit odd but you know you're young and this is still goes on obviously um sadly you just think oh well you know I've got the job and then we were rehearsing in a very small room 
um, somewhere in, in London. And um, there was a point where Joan breaks down, rather like the scene in Ghostlight that you were talking about earlier. She falls to the floor like this with head in hands. And I was suddenly aware of this guy was very large and he, he walked with a walking stick. And I suddenly felt something at the top of my leggings and I shot up and it, he'd got his walking stick and he'd hooked it over the back of my leggings. And, you know, I think he was about to sort of pull down my leggings. And I was furious. Mm. And I, I, I said, what the hell do you think you're doing? And, uh, and I got out of there. Mm. And I got home and the first thing I did was, let's see, I was 21, I guess. I told my mum. And that was the best thing I did because the thing was, I can imagine that I might not have said anything and just allowed that to happen. It would have been so easy to do that. And I can completely see why people have done that. Um, and she was great because she was quite light about it in the way that, right, you know, we called this guy a, a, a silly name and, and it kind of, it allowed me to let go of it. Yeah. And then I thought, right, what, what's the action I can take? So I wrote to Spotlight, I wrote to the stage, which is where I'd done the, uh, seen the audition. I wrote to Equity and I, I spread this guy's name around everywhere. Um, and I talked to other young actresses about, and I then found at an audition for something else, somebody, uh, a girl said, oh yes, I did, I did the same and there were two of us and we had to escape through a window. So, you know, this stuff is real and it does go on and it's, I was very, very lucky in that I knew, somehow I knew how to handle it and you know and got out of there but I'm really so pleased that we can talk openly about these incidents now without feeling because there was a time where you sort of felt oh is it just me being silly you know should you just do this and actually it's vital that we do keep talking about it absolutely absolutely Something that I, I've I've always wondered is um, when you were in the show, it was growing in confidence all the time. And what was your feeling to the fact that year on year you would see that you were being scheduled against Coronation Street? Did that ever? Did how did you feel that you were being viewed by the sixth floor when they kept putting you against the most popular show on British television? Mm. Well, we did the best that anyone's ever done against it, which says a lot about Doctor Who. Um, funnily enough, when we were making the programme, we were just sort of, I, I was talking earlier about being in the present moment, I guess, and we were, we were having fun, telling, telling a great story and just really enjoying being together in the moment. And it was it wasn't really our place and John Nathan Turner was great because he kept all that away from us so we kind of weren't that aware I think there was a bit of disappointment like oh you know if we were on a Saturday traditionally or you know what what could we have achieved with that but you know we we just thought the thing that was more affecting in a way was the as ever, the small pocket of vociferous fans. Um, and I completely understand where, where fans are coming from. And it, it's, a, it's a testament to their passion for the programme. Um, but there was a very negative bunch of fans, as there always is. Um, and we were more aware of that, really. I think Sylvester was in particular. You see, Ace was... Ace was a loved character, really, right from the start. So, kind of, I was, I was lucky in a way. Whereas, what the Doctor Sylvester was sort of tarred with this brush of coming from comedy and being slapstick and everything, and and he realised that very early on, 
and realised what he wanted to do with the character, which he then developed with Andrew Cartmel. Mm. And, you know, watch Survival, watch Ghost Light, watch... But, and even Greatest Show in the Galaxy and, uh, you know, watch season in particular. Uh, well, season 25 and 26 of his. I mean... You look and you think that's an extraordinary doctor. The darkness, the the kind of the the mystery about the doctor. Mm. Um, It's it's amazing, coupled with the lightness and the fun. Mm. Um, But at the time, I think people had gone, oh, this is a slapstick doctor who's playing around with spoons. uh, And and that's what we that's what we heard, really. And so now. I remember I was on a station platform with Sylv not long ago, coming back from a convention, and a fan came up and said, oh, Sylvester McCoy, you were my favourite doctor. I think you're amazing. I grew up with you. You were fantastic. And, you know, he was very, he was lovely as he always is. And we got onto the train and he said, Do you know, it still surprises me that people liked my doctor after all. Um, and, it, and it really, it had affected him. Mm. It must have done. And yet, I I always think, you're right, if you look at season 25 and 26, they're good Doctor Who. And then occasionally, you watch and you go, it's not not about Doctor Who, this is just good telly. Um, Some of it is just damn good telly. I always think The Curse of Fenric stands up as a piece of drama. Take Doctor Who out of it, it stands as a piece of drama, beautifully, I think. It really does. Um... Could I ask, um, when when the show uh, came to an end, 1989, um, you, you, you've you always said that you didn't have an inkling that that was it. Is that right, that you had no idea? Well, then again, you see, John had kept all that away from us, which is absolutely the right thing to do. It was his job, executive producer. He deals with all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, we just, we thought, okay, see you, see you next time. Um, Sylvester was on a contract for the whole of the following season. I was on an, what that's called an optional contract for half of the season, which is uh, either the BBC or I could say, okay, after after that half the se- half the series, we could say goodbye. Um, and yeah, we had this party down in the basement at TVC um, after Ghostlight, which was the last last one that we filmed. And it was sort of, okay, see you next term, because it was a bit like that. By this time, most of the crew that we worked with was an ongoing crew. Um, But, (coughs) pardon me, but that was not to be. (coughs) It's making me cough. (coughs) In fact, I'm just going to have to get some water. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Don't worry, folks. Nothing to do with the virus. I think That's it's good. Just good. Good. in the air today. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So we, it was a surprise, a completely out of the blue thing, um, and um, yeah, it was a shock. It was. Um, I mean, both Sylvester and I were very lucky, and always have been su- subsequently that both of us have other work, had plenty of other work. Um, so it wasn't about that. But even now, you know, like April comes along and I always think, gosh, this was this was the time when we were gearing up for we were starting Doctor Who again. Um, and I did really miss it for the next couple of years. You, you must really have felt totally vindicated in 2005 when the show comes back. And essentially that model is what became modern Doctor Who. Um, you you replace yourself and Sylv with Christopher Eccleston and Billy Piper. And that model, you know, survival, I think, carries... There's a direct line between survival and that first episode. Did you notice that yourself? Yes, I did, absolutely. And Sylvester's always saying, you know, oh, they've got a Second World War one, you know, we did that. And, uh, oh, a Victorian one, we did that. Mm. Um, and, yes, there were very much... Um, 
the sort of the council estate, the the emphasis on the companion. Um, I think it's a brilliant first episode that Rose. I, I watched it again recently. You know, when everybody was watching it together. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just I think it's fantastic. I think Christopher Eccleston is brilliant, especially because uh, I'd only seen it the once when it came back, and I was blown away then. And then watching it again with hindsight it's like oh yes what a great doctor he is yeah and Steve Piper is just I, I love the fact that um uh it concentrates on her quite right for a new audience for Doctor Who uh mm. you know and and it again because when you concentrate on the companion the doctor is allowed to be a little more mysterious I think yeah absolutely well, if we could do a little bit of time travel of our own at this point, Sophie, if that, if we may. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, right at the start of our chat um, about these letters and being able to read in other characters' voices and those voices coming off the page. So here's my copy of, uh -huh. this, of this rather wonderful book, which, which I almost met you um, to have signed at the Fab Cafe in Manchester uh, before a storm stopped that wouldn't we give anything to go back to the days when it was just a storm causing problems yeah, exactly. um but um this book um it's absolutely fascinated me because i started reading it um and i'm a terribly slow reader so i got the audio book as well and started listening to the audio book and the voices that you give to each character are the voices that i'd already heard in my head when i was reading it wow. so, so I think that it, I suspect this may have been passed down the family to an extent. So I was wondering, when you were writing, could you, were you listening to the characters' voices in your head as you were composing the dialogue? Very much. I mean, but I have to say at this point, though, I um, do have to point out that it was definitely a collaborative process, this writing. So I have a huge debt of thanks to Mike Tucker and to Steve Cole, because... Um, they they were I couldn't possibly have done it without them, but don't forget you know that those the characters the the gang I mean I've been watching them on mm. on TV so they're in my head already, and also that I have been lucky enough to have been asked to do a few Thirteenth Doctor audio books as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and apparently I do quite a good Jodie Whittaker, so um, you know that's <laughs> that's a bonus. Um, uh, but and also things like um, squeak, you know. Uh, there's there's Adele uh, who is, yes. uh, and although I didn't base absolutely on her voice, you know, I, I knew what she'd sound like. Yeah, I just I just guess. My husband always says to me, actually, um, and I think this comes from the past, from growing up, um, playing those characters that I used to love. Um, he says, "Oh yeah, well, what does a what does a duck sound like then when it's talking?" And I, and I just I don't know. There's some kind of I don't know. I just kind of can do it. Mm. My brother and I used to play uh, uh, for hours with our dolls and teddies and so on. Mm. Each of them had a personality, and each of them had a voice. And I can remember now. You know, my my big tiny was a really bossy character. And she used to talk like that. That was her voice. Big tiny tears talked like that. Whereas his Teddy, who was for some reason called Teddy Potscrew, um, uh, Teddy Teddy Potscrew sounds. He had a hero voice like that. He sounded like that. So we were always. He could. He does it as well. We we've always given voices to characters, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've been lucky enough to make a living out of it. <laughs> With the book. Um... Will we see more? Was it an enjoyable process to, for you to, to actually sit down and, and create a book? Um, will we possibly see a follow-up? Oh, I think writing is the hardest thing. Right. Uh, uh, I, as I said, Mike and Steve mm. would, it would not have happened had it not been for them. Um, the ideas, the back and forth, the, um, the sort of... Um, <coughs> the voices so gosh I mean I'd love to I'd love to explore more um we'll have to see yeah and finally might I ask you um 
Is there one role uh, in theatre or television, one role which you think, that's the one I want? That's, that's definitely the role that I would like to play now. Oh, golly, that's a very hard one. Mm. I, if I'm totally honest, the role I would love to play now is Ace as an adult. Mm. I would love to um, come back, do some kind of spin-off, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to do the trailer for the season 26 box set. Mm. Um, because, you know, uh, let's let's not pretend that I'm not, uh, believe it or not, I'm not 24 anymore. Mm. And there are, true to say, limited roles for my age group of actresses, which is, which is unfortunate. But I think to, I'd love to do Ace as she is now, and show that, you know, um, women approaching 60, which I can't believe it when I say that, <laughs> um, can be fit, tough. I'd love to do like a, all my own stunts again. You know, I'd love to be running around, you know, jumping in, perhaps not into lull with COVID in April, but you know, I could do that too. Yeah, I, I think if there's any, it's a, she is a gift of a part. Mm. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd love to play her again. Well, Sophie Aldred, um, to pick up on what you said before, Sylvester was absolutely my doctor, not my first doctor, but he was my doctor, and you were my companion. Um, and I relied on the two of you being there. Got me through my parents' divorce, actually. Those 14 weeks in 1989, that it, it, made, it gave me something slightly magical to believe in, so... I will always be grateful. Um, and for anybody who is, as you said before, obviously reading is one way to get yourself uh, through this time. I honestly do recommend this book. It is a fantastic read, available now. Sophie Aldred, thank you very much for talking to us today. Thank you. Oh, Paul, well, thank you so much for all your really interesting questions as well. And it's and, and thank you for that acknowledgement. You know, I, I, that really touches me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.